Awesome. So welcome everybody to our first ever uh, virtual LPFA event, Seven Minute Storytelling. We're super excited to have you all. And uh, we, we can't uh, wait to hear from our amazing presenters. We've got some, some great stuff tonight. Um, just a little housekeeping before we get started. Um, I would love it if everyone in the audience per se could keep themselves muted. Like I said earlier, if you'd like to keep your camera off or on, that's your choice. Um, and I'd also like um, to do a, just a quick land acknowledgement. Um, I'm here uh, from Santa Barbara tonight on uh, Chumash land. And um, with that, um, we are gonna have six presenters tonight, and each of them have seven minutes to tell their story. So the way the format's going to work, they've got 20, 21 slides uh, each and 20 seconds per slide, which comes out to seven minutes exactly. Hence the name, seven minute storytelling. So the point of these presentations is to keep it snappy, move along and uh, give you a, kind of a snippet into what their passions are in the Los Padres. So we're really excited. We are, are gonna finish up every presentation with a brief um, three minute more or less Q and A section. And the way that's gonna work is if you have a question, um, we'd love it for you to type it into the chat box. So if you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a little chat function and you can send your uh, chats directly to me. My name is Kendra Moss and um, I don't know if I've introduced myself yet, but I'm the program manager for the LPFA and I am super excited to have so many people here watching with us and also um, so grateful to all of the uh, presenters here tonight. So yes, the chat is working. Um, we are gonna get started with our first presenter who is no other than our wonderful director, uh, Brian Conant. So Brian, I'm going to share my screen and I will tell you when I have press play, you can go ahead and unmute yourself, Brian. Okay, I should be unmuted. Awesome. Okay, and I'm going to press play. Ready? I'm ready. Okay, here we go. All right, everyone. Um, as Kendra mentioned, I'm Brian Conan. I'm the director of the LPFA. Thanks everyone for coming out here tonight. Um, I thought this was going to be an easy format, this, this seven minutes, 20 seconds, but it's actually super challenging. The 20 seconds flies by pretty quickly. So I think uh, speaking on behalf of all the presenters, we'll try to do the best we can. All right, so who is the LPFA? For those of you who aren't familiar with us, we are a nonprofit partner of the Los Padres Forest. Uh, we try to help out around the forest as much as we can. Uh, we, we like to bring as much information to people and education so that people can use the forest in a responsible manner. Um, one of our favorite things to do is to actually be in the forest with volunteers. Um, I, I saw a lot of names out there. Many of you have volunteered with us before. We, we average around one volunteer project per week out in the forest doing something or another. And you can see some funny photos here, um, you know, from toilets and signs and, trail, and, and clearing trails and doing anything else that we can do out there. Um, this is a map showing all of our trail projects over the past two seasons. Uh, the blue is from two years ago and, and red is from this past season. So you can see we have quite a bit of uh, we cover a, quite a bit, bit of range across the Los Padres Forest, and uh, it seems like every year we're, we're expanding where we work even more and more. Um, for tonight, I'm going to kind of talk about a couple of the projects that we have scheduled and we've been working on um, this season. Um, our trail crew right now is up in Lopez Canyon, San Luis Obispo. We're doing work up there and in Trout Creek and also at American Canyon. These are uh, beautiful spots that we might learn a little, little bit more about later on today. One project that we did last week is we uh, cleared a hazard tree at Pine Spring Camp in the Machesna Wilderness. And th this place is amazing. You can see the spring down there, the spring tank. There isn't water within five miles in any direction of this camp. It's really a, a pretty special spot. And it's up on a ridge line as well. Um, really phenomenal. 
But the problem is you can see the camp is down below that oak tree on the left. And there's this big pine tree that fell down and had, had fallen pretty much right on top of the spring tank and on top of the camp. So that's no good. It's a, it was definitely a hazard. You, you wouldn't want to sleep under there. You wouldn't want to hang out under there. And eventually it could fall out and, and take out the water tank as well. So we went in last week, we had some goats and, and Mike Smith with us. And uh, we brought in crosscut saws and a grip hoist. We were able to, to cut, cut the pine tree into a couple of different smaller sections. And then we uh, put some webbing on it. And with the grip hoist, we slowly but surely, you know, kind of yanked that uh, pine tree out of the oak tree. And at the end of the project, it was a, it was a two, day, two day project for the six of us. This was the camp. You can see that the oak tree there is uh, clear of any kind of hazards. And um, you know, I wouldn't say this is a normal project for us, but it's certainly an exciting one and one that we walked away from feeling really, uh, really good and like we accomplished a lot that people can go and, and use that camp. All right, another trail that we've been working on a little bit lately is the uh, Cold Spring Trail, Mono Jungle Reroute. Um, this is a section of the Cold Spring Trail that crosses the San Ynez River on its way to towards uh, Little Caliente and Mono Camp. <clears throat> Um, going back in time, the, the map on your left shows, um, it shows where the, where the trail was in the 1920s and 30s. It was probably a, a lovely trail that, that went along the edge of Gibraltar Reservoir, but over time sedimentation occurred um, and now there's no longer a lake. The lake is actually two miles away and uh, the trail, instead of going by the lake, it became this swampy mess that, that has kind of taken on the name of the Mono Jungle. And it wasn't uncommon to, to get lost in there get to a spot where there's flagging in three different directions, post holing through mud. Um, it was a mess. Search and rescue was out there a whole bunch, um, you know, getting people out of there. And um, so we, we kind of uh, had an opportunity working with the Forest Service and the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation to, um, to put a reroute in along that section. So you can see in this map, the white shows the, um, the, the old map, the, hist or the historic route, and then the other, the other colors show our current route that we're working on right now. And um, the trail is there. It's uh, not perfect in, in every section of the trail, but as you can see in this before and after here, this, was this, this is right when you cross the San Ynez River, which is where all, all the mess used to begin. And now you can cross, you can find the trail on the other side, and it's, uh, it's pretty smooth sailing all the way uh, across towards Mono. Um, as I mentioned, it's not perfect. There is a lot of chemise that still needs to be grubbed out and, and cut. Um, quite a few chemise stobs that need to be pulled out. And in a few spots, we're going to have to build some crib walls or, or some sort of retaining walls in order to uh, get a full full bench, three foot uh, trail trail bed. But it's looking good. It's it's certainly nothing to be afraid of. You know, I've, I've heard some horror stories of people getting down into the jungle and and just. Uh, you know, opting to, to walk the long way back rather than going across the jungle again. And, and it's certainly something you guys can feel confident checking out. And uh, when you go out there, please, please let us know what you find. All right, another uh, focus of ours this coming year is to continue our work in the Zaka fire scar within Santa Barbara County. This is a pretty ambitious schedule of trails. We're kind of making up from last year. So we're hoping to do all of these, these trails this coming year with a combination of volunteer projects and some higher trail crews. Uh, one of our focuses is going to be working on the Santa Cruz Trail. Um, we're we're going to be doing some work coming from Little Pine down towards 19 Oaks, and then quite a bit of work based out of Santa Cruz Station and working towards the 40 mile wall and back up towards the, the wilderness. So uh, we should have a, a lot of volunteer opportunities to, to go out there and stay at the cabin and do some work out of that area, which is beautiful. And then another focus is to continue the work that we've been doing on the Sisquoc Trail. Uh, this year we'll be uh, working the middle section up, up of the upper Sisquoc, pretty much from Heath to Lower Bear. There's somewhere between 50 and 200 down trees in there at the moment. And so we want to get in there and, uh, and log out the trees the best we can. So that's it. I think that's, that's my six minutes and 20 seconds. But um, thank you all again for coming out um, tonight and, or staying home tonight. And Kendra, Kendra's put a lot of energy and effort into this. We're really lucky to have her on board. And, and all the presenters, um, you guys are, uh, are brave. And uh, for the rest of you, if, if you have kind of enjoyed what you've seen here tonight and you'd like to volunteer for the next one, we're certainly going to be doing uh, uh, some more of these. And so, uh, you know, send us your, uh, your information. We'll get you on the list. Um, and, and for sure, follow us on social media. You can volunteer with us. We're starting to do volunteer projects again. And... Um, 
and use high close Padres. Is that my seven minutes or do I have more to go? That's right. it, Ryan. Great job. Does uh, anybody have any questions for Brian? You can put them in the chat box now. Not Jason, please. I've got a lot of questions. <laughs> Hello, son. <laughs> oh, question from John Lawrence. Uh, Lorenz, Lauren, do you go out when it's a hundred degrees? What? Brian, do you want to answer that? Sorry, I was muted. Uh, yeah, I, I, I try. We really try not to be out there when it's a hundred degrees, but it does happen from time to time. Um, if you are out there and it's hundred degrees, it's best to to you know get your 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 moving on in the morning or in the evening. Um, but we have had a few projects uh, this summer where, where we had Boy Scouts and volunteers and, and hired trail crews out there in 100 plus degree weather. So it does happen. Wonderful. Okay, next question is from one of our presenters, uh, Steven Spearer. Any word on the Romero Canyon gate opening? On Romero yeah, man. It's, the, it's the million dollar question. So at the moment, what we're hearing from the Forest Service is that there is that, that washout on the road between San Ysidro and Romero. That is their focus right now is to get that fixed up. And they were supposed to do it back in September, but the forest was closed at that point in time. Um, word on the street is that once that is repaired, then um, that pretty much means there's no more reasons not to open the Romero gate. So um, first step is get that slide fixed on East Camino and then beyond that, well, let's hope that the, the Romero gate follows and, and opens up after that. Awesome. Any more questions for Brian while you got him? Doesn't necessarily have to be involved. Okay, we got a great question about volunteering. If you're interested in volunteering with the LPFA, we'd love to have you. Shoot us an email. It's volunteer at lpforest.org, um, forest is one R, and we'd love to have you. You can get on our volunteer list and um, you can get our newsletter that way. Um, we're always having projects of all kinds of scale. So we'd love to have you join us and we're working all over, uh, all over the forest. Awesome. Any more questions? We got one more minute for Brian. I'll be here all night. People can always uh, chime in later on too. Very true. Awesome. All right. So let's move uh, to our next uh, presenter is going to be Mike Mackey. And Mike, we're super excited if you'd like to... Um, unmute yourself. I'm going to pull up your presentation here and we'll get started. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, good. You. All good. All right. And I will tell you when I press. Play. Oh wait, nope, that's not the right one. Hold on. Sorry, everybody. Okay. And I'm pressing play, Mike. All right. <laughs> well, like Brian said, this was kind of an, an odd format to try and do this. But uh, anyway, thanks for having me on tonight. And what I wanted to do was to describe what the Condor Trail is and share some of my experiences uh, when I section hiked it in the spring of 27 and 2018. It was really one of the, the greatest experiences I've ever been on. And I really got to learn a lot about the Los Padres. So what is the Condor Trail? It's a 400 plus mile trail. It's actually more of a route through the Los Padres starting at Lake Piru in the south and then ending at Botcher's Gap Campground in the north. And it passes through Ventura, Santa Barbara, San Luis Obispo and Monterey counties. <clears throat> and the trail consists of a mix of maintained trails, unmaintained trails, dirt roads, paved roads, even some boardwalks on the beach. And best of all, there's a fair amount of open country. There's about 28 miles of highway along Highway 166, Highway 41, and the uh, Pacific Coast Highway. 
The route traverses primarily through national forest lands, but it also includes several miles of beach walking between the northern and southern parts of the Los Padres. And this includes Morro Strand, Estero Bluff, San Simeon, and the elephant seal hauling grounds near uh, Cambria. So some things that you wouldn't normally think of when you're thinking of the, uh, the Los Padres. And in addition to the national forest lands and state park lands, the trail traverses from south to north the Cespi, the Dick Smith, San Rafael, Garcia, Santa Lucia, Silver Peak, and Ventana Wildernesses. As you can tell, I like to have my picture near wilderness signs. In regards to the, uh, the topography that's traversed, in the south, the trail primarily follows rivers and streams. These include Agua Blanca Creek, Cespi and Sisquoc, Piedra Blanca Creek, Tinta and Santa Barbara Canyons <coughs> Creeks, La Brea, Stony and Trout Creeks, just to name a few. However, it does climb a few peaks and ridges, including Haddock Peak. The northern section after the beaches adds the beauty of the redwoods. Now, this terrain is more of an up and down and in and out of small canyons. There are a few creeks followed like Salmon and Willow Creek and also the Carmel River. But it does also climb some peaks, including High Mountain, Mount Low, and, and Tessahara Peak as well. So hiking the trail. Some have through hiked it. Brittany Nielsen is probably the most notable. She's said to be the first person to hike the trail in May and June of 2015. And there have been several others, including Brian Sarvis, who's done it in both directions, Sean Nordine, Monica and Justin with their dogs, and most recently, Pat and Alyssa White, who have a great video YouTube out recently. If, if you get a chance to take a look at it, it's great. So hiking the trail, uh, section hiking, that's how I did it. I did it over two springs in 2017 and 2018, north to south. And the advantage of section hiking is you get to choose your weather and the distance that you want to hike for each section. The disadvantage is you do miss the, the through hike experience and you do have some additional access miles. So my section hike over the two springs consisted of six day hikes. I had three two day hikes, four four day hikes and one five day hike for a total of 33 days and 19 nights. The section hiking did require some access mileage from trailheads like Nera and Santa Barbara Canyon that added a few miles, but for the most part, my mileage was just over 400 miles. The isolation, probably my most isolated section was from Manzana Schoolhouse North to Highway 166. I did not see another person for four days and three nights. And this was in the Sierra Madre Mountains in the San Rafael Wilderness. Great time up there, nobody around at all. And almost as equally isolated was my last three days or so as I got near the north end of Potter's Gap. I probably saw less than five or six people and this was probably the result of Botcher's Gap being closed, so not a lot of people were able to access that part of the forest up there in the north. So a couple of quick stories from my section hike. On my second day out from Lake Piru, I had not seen anyone since I started, but I was following a fresh set of, sh of shoe prints up Ag Agua Blanca Creek. About midday in the middle of the creek, I saw someone standing taking a break. I think he was surprised as me to see someone else, and it turns out it was Brian Sarvis who was finishing that section of the Condor Trail. So what were the odds? We hadn't seen anybody for days and we run into each other in Agua Blanca Creek. And then my next section, I was hiking with a friend of mine near Reyes Peak. We hadn't seen anybody for two days and a gentleman passed us and it turned out it was Sean Nordine, I later learned as, as he was finishing up his section hike of the Condor Trail. So a note on uh, what I found to be some very enjoyable and some very difficult sections of the trail. And I'll start with the difficulties. I found the Southern Los Padres to be easier than the North. The Black Cone Trail in the north was a bear, very overgrown and a sloping tread for miles. Very difficult section to get through and probably a result of the Soberanus fire. And of course, there's Portasuela. Some of you may have heard about that trail. It took me over four hours just to go up one mile up the creek. Just fallen snags obscured most of the trail. It was very, very overgrown and difficult to follow. And hopefully someday we can get up there and, and get that section of the trail open. It's actually a very nice section, beautiful stream up there. I love the southern section rivers, particularly the Sisquoc. Um, each day I thoroughly enjoyed the crossings of the river and finding my way down that stream. I really enjoyed uh, Lower Bear Camp and, and actually all the camps in the Sisquoc are, are just amazing places to camp. It's, it's such a great place at Lower Sisquoc. And then uh, Big Narrows on Agua Blanca Creek. I was intimidated at first. I had never been there and I was going up there in late March after a heavy winter and, and didn't know what to expect, but uh, the conditions were just perfect for going through there. It had, it had been recently cleaned out and, and just a great place to hike. So if you have never been to Big Narrows, that's just a small section of it right there. 
And Caldwell Mesa up in the north really sticks out. It's just a beautiful Potrero with old rusting farming equipment all scattered about. And there's just something about it that sticks in my memory. Just a beautiful place. The trail crosses across this uh, this big meadow. It's just a, a really neat uh, neat section of trail. And then the north coast, what can you say? Um, I did find it odd that much of the hiking was above the redwoods in the chaparral as, as the redwoods mostly grew in the lower parts of the moister canyons. But uh, most of the hiking is actually above the redwoods, although you do pass through some of them and great views of the coast up there on the, on the north coast of the, of the Los Padres. And then of course, the famous photo at Botcher's Gap that we all try and get. Um, I got real lucky because the road to Botcher's Gap was closed because of the, the fire up there the, the previous years. And my wife got lucky when some forest service contractors let her drive up. So I didn't have to hike the last five or six miles down to the gate. So. Anyway, if you ever get a chance to hike any portion of the of the condor or the whole thing, it's it's a great experience and I would really encourage you to get out there and do it. It's a great way to learn about the Los Padres. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mike. Wow. Sure. Really inspiring. Um, if anybody's got questions for Mike, they want to post them in the chat box. Um, go ahead. We've got a few comments saying that we want to hear more than seven minutes. Mike, would you ever be interested in being a, a guest on our uh, yet to be released podcast? Oh, absolutely. No, I, I, I love promoting the Condor Trail. It, it was just such a great experience that, uh, yeah, I love promoting it. It's an awesome place. Awesome. awesome trail, awesome places that it goes. Places that I never would have probably visited had I not decided to do this. So it's a great way to get out there and learn about it. Wonderful. How do you navigate some of the parts that have no trail? Yeah, GPS. So there is a, um, there are routes that are published and uh, GPS is amazing on uh, just following a track that someone has laid down. And, and I was amazed at some of the tracks that, that had been created and I just followed. And sometimes if you're off 10 or 20 feet, you notice it, but, but GPS, using a GPS to follow tracks is definitely much easier these days than, than trying the old fashioned uh, topo map, which comes in handy at times, but GPS really gets you through a lot of those spots. And did you ever lose your GPS or lose service? Uh, I did. I lost cell service quite a bit, but uh, no, GPS works without cell service. So as long as you have a clear view of the sky, GPS functions great. And you don't need a fancy GPS, just something on an old iPhone or a mobile phone works great. Awesome. Do you know a little bit about the origin and the history of the Condor Trail, Mike? That's a better question for Brian. Brian okay. can answer that much better than me. Yeah. Brian, you want to jump in and answer that? Sure. Yeah, it, uh, it originated with a gentleman named Alan Coles out of um, the, kind of the southern, I think he lives in Long Beach technically, but he uh, he's famous for work, doing trail work on the Agua Blanca Trail. And actually, he's going to be leading a series of, of trail projects out there. You can find it on our Facebook page. But uh, he had a, he had a vision of of building a trail or connecting existing trails from um, Lake Piru all the way up to the Manzana Schoolhouse in the Santa Fe Wilderness. And so he sort of took that idea and, and ran with it for a little bit. And then uh, another uh, guy named Chris Danch sort of um, got involved, and, and he took it in, in a step larger and thought, well. If we're taking the trail all the way up to the schoolhouse, wh why not just extend it beyond that? So uh, the vision then kind of expanded to to include, um, you know, the rest of Santa Barbara County and San Luis and Monterey County all the way up to, to Botcher's Gap. And um, since then, it's gone through a few other people have been involved. And, and um, it's, it's uh, I, I think, as uh, Mike mentioned, in 2015, when Brittany kind of pioneered it, first finished it, that was a that was a big step. And since then, we've had um, you know, over, over a dozen or so people that, that have, um, you know, finished it. So it's, it's exciting. Awesome. And uh, for anyone who wants a little more info on the trail, thank you to Craig Carey for posting a little bit uh, of a resource there. You can read about it. Um, one more question. How much water did you uh, take with you for that hike? Um, you know, the nice thing about section hiking it in the spring after years of normal rain, uh, there's water everywhere. So I really never had to carry with me more than about two liters of water. So uh, if you do it in the springtime when, when it's cool and there's plenty of water, it's really not an issue. 
Awesome. And last question from Brian. Did you cross Highway 101 at Cuesta grade? I did. Well, I actually finished one section there and then uh, so I didn't have to cross Highway 101. I came back and continued another section on the other side. So I didn't have to cross the highway. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Round sure. of applause yep. for Mike. Thank you, everybody. And um, next up, we have Reese McAllister. So I'm going to mute everybody and then Reese. Um, if you'd like to unmute and say hello. Hello, everyone. How are we doing tonight? We're doing great. All right. I'm going to share my screen and then I'll tell you when I press play. All right. Sounds good. All right. Ready to go? Yeah. Oops. All right. So. Uh, so this picture is from uh, Cream Puff Peak, which is actually uh, the, the unnamed peak to the west of Hines. Uh, so Santa Paula Canyon is a beautiful and rugged area whose unique geology and native flora are characterized by intense seasonal flooding. Uh, most people that come here are just uh, coming for the overly popular tourist attractions, but within the remote corners of this ancient canyon lie a rich history uh, and maybe even a few hidden gems waiting to be discovered. Santa Paula Canyon has been inhabited by modern humans since uh, sometime around the end of the Pleistocene Epoch, probably about 10,000 to 14,000 years ago. Uh, the original inhabitants were members of a linguistic family known as the Chumash. Um, here we see an image from a mural, uh, mural at the local library, which is depicting a village scene. Uh, Santa Paula Canyon was once home to the Chumash village of Seesaw. Uh, very similar to the name of Cesar Canyon, uh, it was said to be a vibrant trading hub between different bands of the Chumash as well as other tribes. Uh, Santa Paula Canyon was a resource-rich area. Uh, the early inhabitants had access to large quantities of steelhead trout, deer, rabbit, quail, bear, acorns, and chia, along with a variety of other plant species. Uh, here we see a California black bear skull. Um, Let's see, South Santa Paula Canyon also once held a very productive run of steelhead trout. These fish were um, anadromous, meaning that they were born in freshwater, would journey out to the ocean to mature, and then return to, back to freshwater to spawn. Uh, what makes them unique to amongst salmonoid species is that they do not die immediately after spawning. They're able to repeat this cycle numerous times. So right here is actually a picture of some guys from Piru uh, who got these very, very large steelhead from uh, the Santa Clara, Clara River. Uh, landlocked native rainbow trout can still be found throughout the watershed. Uh, fishing along the trail is prohibited. You have to get past the first swimming hole at Santa Paula Canyon Falls. And then after that, you're required to use barbless hooks and uh, art there's no artificial lures. Uh, so salmon eggs and split shots are your best bet, but I'd be really careful fishing uh, such a sensitive population. Um, Santa Paula Canyon is also a hot spot of biodiversity. You can find a lot of different types of uh, rare succulents, cedar, and oak species. Uh, the, you can find Echeveria, Dudelias, Incense Cedar, and Canyon Live Oaks as well. Uh, Big Cone Douglas fir are endemic to Southern California with a range from Santa Barbara to San Diego counties. The East Fork of Santa Paula Canyon, however, has the highest concentration of Big Cone Douglas firs on the planet. Um, adjacent to the East Fork is Pine Canyon. Uh, which the wood for the Ventura mission was sourced from. It was kind of an interesting fact. Um, Santa Paula Canyon is home to numerous historic landmarks and camps. Uh, Big Cone, Cross Camp, Last Chance, Jackson Hole, Santa Paula Canyon Falls, and the Punch Bowl, just to name a few. Uh, this photo has um, the trail register, or uh, the camp register from uh, Last Chance Camp there with a view of Hines Peak in the background. Uh, Big Cone Camp's named after the trees that surround all the sites there. Uh, cross Camp is named after the cross that's featured in this photo right here. It's believed to be around two centuries old. Uh, it's not sure if it was uh, carved by the Jesu uh, missionaries or if it was carved by the Chumash themselves. Uh, Jackson Hole was believed to have been a favorite uh, hunting camp of an old ranger. And Last Chance was said to be the last reliable uh, year-round water source before heading over into the Sespe. Right here you see the Punch Bowl, which the whole area has um, become known for. But historically, the first waterfall was called, called Horse Hole. Uh, the second waterfall was known as the Moon Rocks, and then this one right here uh, was known as the Punch Bowl. And so it also features a natural water slide, as you can see. Um, an easy three and a half mile hike to the first waterfall, waterfall has led to this area being plagued with graffiti and trash. On average, uh, weekend hordes of out-of-towners flock here by the hundreds. 
Uh, many of them are equipped with nothing more than flip flops and a water bottle. Uh, and they're ready to dump their belongings on the trail as soon as the hike gets hard. These are oftentimes the same individuals who require search and rescue to come and get them home from this moderate outdoor excursion. Uh, an overall lack of respect for nature by littering and failing to prepare takes a toll on the local me community, requiring hundreds of hours of volunteer efforts amongst an unknown amount of taxpayer dollars and rescue efforts. Destruction reached an unprecedented level during the summer of 2020. Uh, Geotag fueled social media oversaturation and COVID related trail closures led to over a thousand people being counted in the area in a single afternoon. Highway 150 became a major public safety concern. Uh, there's trash and cars all along the road, people walking in the middle of the highway. With all the blind corners, it was a tragedy waiting to happen. Um, local residents responded to this disturbing abuse of nature by coming out in the hundreds to volunteer their time and materials. Hundreds of pounds of trash and countless pieces of graffiti were removed, uh, and a temporary trail closure allowed the canyon time to heal. Uh, after a series of wildfires, the canyon has reopened along with the rest of the forest. In my opinion, the only permanent solution to this problem is installing permanent no parking song signs along Highway 150 and limiting parking to the two pullout lots located above and below Thomas Aquinas. Uh, trash and graffiti will never go away completely, but this would limit the amount of visitors and in turn keep the damage at a level that volunteers can keep up with. Um, in, in sharing this place with you, I ask that you just please respect our few remaining wild places. Please practice leave no trace wilderness ethics when going out and don't geotag. I think there might be a couple more photos left. Thank you. Awesome. We've got a lot of great uh, comments in the chat box. Um, Darren would like to know where exactly is Santa Paula Canyon? Um, so Santa Paula Canyon is located off of Highway 150. Um, the trailhead is directly north of T Thomas Aquinas College. Um, so it's kind of kind of smack dab in the middle of the Sespe Wilderness. Awesome. I'm going to stop sharing. I got to the end. And thank you very much, Reeves, for that great explanation. Loved it. Um, yeah, no problem. Thank you. We've got a question from Kim Fly. What trail would you recommend for a first trip to this area? Um, for someone who's just starting out hiking, um, a hike to, to any one of those three first swimming holes is a great way to get started. Uh, for someone who's a little bit more experienced, the Last Chance Trail out to Jackson Hole is a really awesome one if you're feeling more adventurous. Wonderful. And um, we do have to give a shout out to Ellie Mora, Reese, and all the volunteers who cleaned up the canyon and removed the graffiti, um, especially during lockdown and the subsequent closure of uh, Santa Paula Canyon. Um, it's definitely been a challenge watching all the geotagging happening and with more people than now than ever before. Um, with free time on their hands, um, getting out into nature. Uh, it's been sad to watch. So thank you for bringing um, attention to this to this area and for all the cleanups you've done, Reese. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. I'm very, very happy to be of service. Um, you know, I, I really love this area. So I'm, I'm, it's no problem at all to give back. Uh, yeah, huge shout out to Ellie for organizing all this. Um, she's been amazing in uh, mobilizing everybody and getting things done. And um, yeah, a huge, huge thank you to all the volunteers that have come out too. We've had a really, really uh, great turnout from the local community. It's been very positive. Reese, can you quickly explain what geotagging is for those of us who aren't on Instagram and aren't familiar with that term? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so geotagging is when uh, you post a photo and uh, you have the option to select a location on there and, and you tag the location. So what that does is it just blasts it online and, and makes it accessible to absolutely anybody. Um, and I mean, th these are public lands, you know, we all have a right to go and recreate out in them. Um, but it makes it, it known to people who aren't going out there with the right intentions or people who don't also along with that right take the responsibility to care for these public lands. Um, so it's just a really dangerous thing and something to be aware of in, in the modern age. Um, they say that that leave no trace wilderness ethics extends to our digital footprint as well. So it's just something really important to be aware of. 
Yeah, one great question from Kelsey Perry. How would you recommend to successfully communicate with someone you see in the act of littering or painting graffiti? Um, I mean, education is a great tool, you know, uh, we, we've had a, always had a really uh, positive response, you know, when, when we're out um, cleaning up, sometimes other people will come and get involved and, and help out and stuff. Um, or, you know, they'll, they'll just make a point of coming to tell us thank you. Um, so, I mean, you can just try and try and let them know why what they're doing is wrong, you know, um, try and engage with them. Um, but I mean, you never know how people are going to respond to it. So always be careful. Yeah. Thank you, Reese, so much. And thank you uh, for the work that you're doing out in the field. It's super important to have folks like you and I would say especially young folks. So thank you. Thank you very much. No problem. Happy to be here. And thank you for organizing this. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. So our next uh, presenter is Stephen Searer. And I'm going to, um, Stephen, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Yeah, is, this, is it working? Yeah. Perfect. I'm going to share my screen once more. And then we'll get to your presentation. And ready here we go all right well yeah thank you for having me tonight uh I'll, i guess i'll be kind of talking a little bit about some of my front country mid country uh it, it, adventures kind of around santa barbara and uh i think this first photo is a kind of a good example of the hikes that i usually do which is going to a normal place but then seeing it from a slightly different angle and so that is actually that was cathedral peak from barger peak in the front country. And uh, so it's just a, kind of a unique view, but I thought I'd point out uh, Matillaha to Franklin Traverse, which was kind of a through hike that I had done with some friends. Matillaha was actually like the first area that I had visited locally. And so it really unlocked my uh, imagination for the outdoors. And so these are just a few views kind of along that trail uh, coming from Matillaha and Ojai all the way through along, along um, I guess, Divide Peak and then down Franklin Trail into Carpinteria. And so it was fun to hike all the way through, see this natural landscape that's so beautiful and end up in our friend's uh, garage drinking beers uh, when the hike was done. So it was a lot of fun. And then these are just kind of some, uh, you know, a little bit of different views. Jameson from the back with the sunset in the, in the, uh, in the back country there. And then just kind of a classic uh, overcast front country look from up above where it's actually, you're above the clouds, uh, pretty common uh, view. Somehow along the way, I got uh, really interested in going off trail in the front country. I think COVID did it to me where I was a little bit bored and stir crazy. And so I thought I would just go check out some new uh, areas that are familiar, but a little bit different. And so uh, this is a spot you can kind of see for the scale in the picture on the right, there's a person uh, up there just to kind of give an idea of how massive these boulders are. This is a spot that's up a creek uh, that's I guess really close to a popular hiking trail. And so these are the sorts of things that's really fun to discover. Uh, plenty of people have been there before in the past, but it's kind of fun personally to rediscover them for myself. Um, here's another off trail creek spot that's uh, pretty special. It currently still has water this deep through summer, which is uh, really neat to see. Uh, and also just getting to experience the ge geology uh, as you can see there. Uh, Tangerine Falls, people obviously is a pretty common one here in Santa Barbara, but I decided to follow an old trail that uh, doesn't really exist anymore, but kind of exists uh, and kind of explore that area that you can see. It's still really lush, lots of water. And again, getting to see kind of the front country from the different angles. So this is actually looking west, Camino Cielos on the right. And so to me, when I see this picture, it makes me wonder what's in all those little valleys and nooks and crannies. Like, can I go in there and see, you know, what, what can we find um, that's interesting? And one of those was actually trying to find the headwaters of the Montecito Creek. And so I just kind of tromped up and my joke, my dumb joke with this is on the map, it looks like two blue lines converging, but on this, it's actually in real life, it's two green lines converging and it's two 
small creeks coming together, uh, feeding, feeding its way down uh, over Tangerine Falls. But I actually was pretty successful in getting to the headwaters. You can kind of see these are common views as you're going up uh, creeks is just kind of some falls, but on the far one on the right is actually where there's no water above that. And then I didn't go any farther either because there was a uh, deer carcass and I thought I should get out of there uh, as quickly as I can. Um, here's another kind of front country area, popular, near popular hiking trails. Um, I got some scrambling workout. And one of the things about hiking I think is that's really fun is around every corner you kind of get to feel like a kid. You don't really know what's coming next. And so this is a perfect example where around a bend there's this huge 80 to 100 foot rock walls that has kind of been eaten out uh, by, by water um, over time. And it's just really impressive to kind of just walk around not that far from home, you know, maybe an hour in and you can see amazing stuff. Some of the local flowers, again, I talked quite a bit about some off trail uh, areas, but these ones are all uh, rare or semi-rare flowers that you can actually see along front country trails. And so it's pretty special to be able to see uh, these beautiful uh, flowers there. One of my kind of highlights of the year, uh, even though COVID is not that fun, um, it was, uh, this is kind of my favorite hike during, it was kind of an off trail uh, jaunt in, um, you know, kind of in the, in the local wilderness that I had heard about. And uh, it started off with a bushwhack at dawn and I learned that bushwhacks at dawn are not fun. And so uh, you can kind of see here this creek, um, tons of boulders have fallen over and covered the creek. And there's actually like a hole in the bottom there in the middle. And as you, uh, you know, you can kind of get down in there and in the next picture it'll show it's pretty big for scale, those rocks are huge. And the water itself was chest high, head high in a lot of spaces and just a really special uh, area and I think I echo Reese in the no geotagging. Um, Cause again, this is kind of a special place that's within reach and it's the type of place that people would love to come and drink a bunch of beers and leave them there. And so I think, you know, the more of these places that we can keep wild, the better. Um, this spot was really special. I remember coming to it and wondering, what do I, where do I go from here? You know, I was kind of climbing up the Creek and the answer was actually to go under through the rocks and you can actually climb in here. Uh, it was about maybe waist high water. You know, I'm six five. And so I was able to walk through this. So just a, again, a really special area. The water's amazingly blue. Um, just, I, I couldn't really describe it, but uh, one of the things that I just love is getting out there, seeing new things. Um, and it, to me, any time that you can find something new like this, at least new to me, um, it really makes me want to go out again in the future. Uh, and then the, the, I guess, I don't know if there's one more, but in the, uh, in the next slide, this one is just again, showing that br beautiful blue water, but it reminds me that on this, this hike, um, I had all the right gear. I had everything that I needed, but you can have the right gear, but you can still make bad decisions. And so one of the things that I should have done was uh, fill up my water to the max on the way out. And I didn't really do that. And I started getting some cramps. So just a word uh, of caution to everyone is even if you have the right gear, you got to use wisdom and be smart when you're out there or else you'll use those resources. Um, some people ask why I do this. To me, it helps me connect with nature and I feel much more a part of this local area than I ever have just kind of exploring it a lot more. And, you know, I want this place to be wild and amazing for, for the future generations. And I hope that somehow going to visiting them and talking about them with excitement, you know, kind of unlocks them for uh, the future for people to protect and know. So thank you. Oh, yay. Thank you so much, Stephen. Yeah, you're welcome. Awesome to hear and see. So yeah, we had a question about um, some of the flowers and it looks like Craig jumped in to answer that uh, from left to right. Um, let me see if I'm getting these names right. The Ojai fritillary, Humboldt lily in the middle and a late blooming Mariposa lily on the right. 
Yeah, those are all, for me, that was a really, those are all really special flowers. There's plenty of other wildflowers. Um, the Ojai Fertillery was pretty amazing because I was, I was actually trail running and I, when I saw it and I just had to stop and, you know, check it out. They're really small. Um, where Humboldt lilies are pretty large. Uh, yeah. But then Mariposa lilies, the late blooming, it's so amazing because there's, they kind of, a lot of these are in patches. And so you'll kind of get into a patch of them and they're just all over the place. And so that was the case with the uh, uh, late blooming Mariposa lily there. Very cool. Mike Mackey asks, how are you with poison oak? <laughs> uh, I'm pretty good. I don't get poison oak that uh, very badly. A lot of people get it if they just look at it. Um, I have, I've been blessed, I guess, with, uh, not getting it, not getting it too bad. I use, I make sure to use tech new, uh, you know, right when I get home, just in case, but surprisingly in a lot of the creeks, if you're kind of like hopping on the rocks up the middle of it, there's not, it's not too thick. It's kind of when you start getting on the edges of the Creek and climbing out of them that it gets horrible. Um, so. Awesome. Does anyone have any more questions for Steven here? I've got a question for you, Stephen, since I'm, uh, I have a lot of friends who go off trail and many of them end up lost. So <laughs> what would your suggestion be for folks who do decide to, you know, go off trail or follow a Creek? Uh, what would your advice yeah. be for people getting back? No, that's a, it's a good, it's a good point. So I always, there, um, one of the things I, I think a lot of people will know, know who this is, but I have a uh, rule that if Dave, David Stillman would do something, then I wouldn't do it. And so it's basically, he, he used to blog and do these like uh, pretty wild adventures. And so I try to not do that. So if there's a ledge that looks like it's too high that I wouldn't be able to climb down, I'm gonna stop there and not keep going. I also spend a lot of time looking at maps and I bring maps with me. I've got my GPS, I've got all of this stuff. So. I really try to make sure that if I'm going somewhere like on that, even from Tangerine Falls to East Camino Cielo, I had my GPS so I could follow the route. So I try to be really careful with that. Um, and I've got like my uh, beacon so I can text my wife when and I'm inevitably, inevitably going to be late. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. And our next presenter is um, Shad Springer. So Shad. Hello, that's me. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Good. Um, All right. While you set it up, I just want to give a shout out to those three amazing presentations from Mike, Reese, and Steven. Um, amazing. Uh, Reese, if you're still here, I've been following you on social media for uh, several years, and I really enjoy your post on Instagram. They're pretty amazing. So if anybody's on Instagram, you should check out Reese at Los Padres Lost Boy. Uh, and I can't believe how much you get out there, Reese. Um, you're just like out there like every week. It's pretty amazing. So, and uh, Stephen, nice to see you. I know we, uh, we, we communicate back and forth a bit on social media as well. So yeah, so Brian reached out to me uh, and said, hey, you know, you do a lot of miles in the Los Padres. I I have done, I don't even know, thousands of miles in the Los Padres over the last 10 years. He said, what do you want to do? I said, I said, you know, uh, I, uh, I like to have my partner, Maggie, kind of drive me out to different trailheads and I, I hike home. So I'm going to talk about it. So I call it a mini through hike. And so the real through hike in Los Padres is the Condor Trail that Mike talked about, of course, but most of us don't have time to go out and spend a month or months like the PCT or AC, um, some of the other trails. So I'm a school teacher and I have my spring break the last week of March. So I do these big trips. Uh, and so um, the first one I did is in 2015. I had my partner drop me off at Naira Trailhead and I hiked home. Thanks to Brian for making this, this map. You can kind of see the route route there where I'm going from sort of north uh, west to the south back home to downtown. I exit usually uh, Rattlesnake uh, Canyon Trailhead or Tunnel. I love Naira. It's kind of my go-to spot in the San Rafael wilderness. Um, if you live in the area and you haven't been there yet, like put it on your list. It's incredible. There, so there's a picture of me in 2015. Um, and 
So it's in the Manzana drainage. And the first time that I went, uh, so I love to get into the Sisquak. Uh, I know it's been mentioned by a couple of our presenters already. One thing I love about the Sisquak is it's so remote that it's hard for the hunters to get back in there. And you can see so many signs of bears. Um, and so you see a bear print on the left. And uh, by the way, the one on the right was the largest bear scat that I've ever seen. A uh, great place for uh, wildlife. That uh, March of 2015 trip was unseasonably hot. So I had five different rattlesnake encounters that were uh, pretty nuts. You see a Western pond turtle there and then a horned lizard as well. So part of my theme is going to be that it's different every year when you go out and go, even if you go the same exact days every year. Another thing I'm a big proponent of is dry camping. So on the left is um, Big Pine Spring, and I like to stock up on water there, but it's a very cold campsite. So on this trip in 2015, I went and camped out on West, uh, kind of on the ridge from West Big Pine there, and it's beautiful. Um, I'm also a huge proponent of cowboy camping. Um, I have camped uh, well over 100 nights in Los Padres, and I would say over 90% of the time I cowboy camp. I um, bring a, a light shelter with me, which you will see later, but sleeping outdoors is wonderful in the, in the Los Padres. Just make sure to check, check your weather forecast. The second time I hiked from Niagara was 2017, my spring break. This was actually to date my longest backpacking trip in the Los Padres. Uh, I can see the, the mileage there. I actually uh, started from Niagara and this time went the opposite direction for the first half of the day because I, I love getting up on Hurricane Deck. It's one of my favorite trails. And when you time it right, and uh, in this year, in 2017, the wildflowers were amazing. Um, so any excuse I can get to get up onto hurricane deck, uh, I, I take it. And so on the phone on the left, you're looking um, west towards, you can see Castle Rock there. And then you've got Shooting Stars, which is one of my favorite wildflowers. So then from there, I head up the Sisquak drainage for about 30 miles over a couple of days. And um, you do have to cross it innumerable times, about, I don't know, maybe 75 times or so. But I just can't get enough of the Sisquak. Uh, I, I, I spend a ton of time and it's just, it's a, it's a wild and scenic river if you don't know that. Um, an area I love to head down through as I kind of make my way back south is Indian Canyon. I'm gonna talk about it again in a minute, but um, uh, I happen to go through in, um, 2017, right after the Ray fire. And so just know that our, our backcountry changes a lot based on what's happening with the fire. So um, also what I love about going the same week every year is that the, that the, the backcountry is different. So this is a spot of uh, the mono drainage just down where it meets, uh, just below where it meets the Seninas River. And look how different it is from just one year to the next. That's This photo is taken on almost the same day. So on the left, you have a kind of warmer spring. And then on the right, it was a little colder and drier. So um, the last time I did a big uh, kind of what I call my mini through hike home is I always want to do a north south. So I started from the Lisa Park Trailhead in Cuyama Valley and kind of is pretty much due south. Uh, I took six days and 77 miles to do this trip. And uh, so it does mean you're gonna, I was on Sierra Madre Road. Um, and I know some people kind of poo-poo the, the dirt roads along the ridges, but I actually love them. Yeah, and so there you see what it's like on the left looking south uh, into the Sisquoc and into the north into Cuyama Valley. And Ridge, ridge roads are great. I think of them as just really wide trails and they really allow me to get to places from one place to another. So obviously uh, the Los Padres have to be prepared for anything and really any, any time of year. And so I do take a shelter on the left. Um, it was so cold that I, I put my shelter up uh, on the left in this 2018 trip. Uh, and then I just threw in a picture from March of 2012 uh, of post hilling through snow on Big Pine Mountain. So on that 2018 trip, I dropped down into the, the Sisquoc, and this is just below um, Lower Bear Camp. I know Mike mentioned liking camping there. Uh, and um, same time, but I came upon a ladybug migration that I had never seen before, even though I've been through the same spot many times before. Now on this trip, I consulted with Brian and I, they'd finally cleared uh, the sort of uh, Dick Smith, uh, the Alamar Trail area. So I dropped into the Alamar and went through an area on my bucket list called the Loma Paloma. And it is phenomenal. If you like these massive potreros or sort of open spaces, it is not to be missed. Now I talked about Indian Canyon before, but the main part of it is four miles of off trail. You are kind of going through the canyon 
Um, and it's one of my favorite spots anywhere in the back country. Um, I prefer to bring a rope for that section on the left. Um, although I know people like my buddy James Wapatich just free climbs it down with his pack on. I do not do that. So if you're going to tackle uh, um, Indian Canyon, maybe think about bringing a rope with you. And so I always end my, my trips by uh, kind of cresting the San Inez range. And I just love that site where I come over and I, I look and I see town and I see the ocean out there in the distance. And it is, it is a feeling unlike anything that I really know. So if you're thinking about this, things are probably pretty obvious when I'm pointing out things. So like, you know, Brian's maps are gold. I, I just, you know, I spend hours pouring over them uh, and also uh, go to hypelospadres.com to get all of the uh, most recent water and trail conditions. So just things to, to, uh, to think about. So uh, thank you. That's my, uh, my, my, my presentation. I just want to give a shout out also to Los Padres Forest Association. We couldn't do the things that we do without you guys. So um, thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dad. Wow. I know it's not easy to fit all the information that you want to in such a short amount of time. So. I was talking as fast as I, as I could there. <laughs> that was great. It was awesome. Um, so yeah. a couple great questions coming in. Yeah, um, I, I can see yeah. them. Yeah, how do you plan your daily mileage? Yeah, on these through hikes? That's a good question. So uh, my, my sort of sweet spot I found is kind of 15 miles, but that really is not the case always because like what time of year is it? So obviously if you're going in the winter, you don't have a lot of daylight. So you have to like adjust your mileage accordingly. If I'm going through Indian Canyon, man, it takes me, if I'm lucky, I can go a mile and an hour, you know, if that, so it really is dependent on the, on the train, but if I'm on some pretty solid trail, you know, like, and it's not the winter solstice, like for me, my sweet spot's kind of 15 miles, but for everyone, it's different depending on how fast or slow you like to hike, what your physical condition is, so on and so forth. Awesome. We had one question from Ian Nicholson. Any issues with bears getting into your food along the cis walk? No, I've never had that issue. And uh, one thing, um, uh, so you really don't need to carry a bear canister or, or frankly hang your food if you're in camp. Now, sometimes if I will have a base camp and go uh, day hike out, I will hang my, my food in a tree, but it's really less about bears and more uh, critters. Uh, that might get into them, uh, like like rodents and things like like that. So the bears are actually very wild and um, afraid of humans in the Sisquoc, and as far as I know, pretty much anywhere in the Los Padres. So that's never been an issue for me. So I actually just sleep with my food just kind of next to me. Um, I usually throw it in my uh, in my rucksack, but then just kind of have it next to me um, while I sleep. Great. <laughs> Craig, and my sweet spot is five miles and six beers. Craig, I got to point out, I have your, your book here, buddy. I got it. So, and I haven't forgotten, Craig, that you owe me a beer from the time that I gave up the campsite at Blue Canyon for your Boy Scouts. <laughs> that is absolutely true, nor have I forgotten. All right. All right. <laughs> um, one more question here from Dan. How long does it take to hike from Mono to Indian Narrows slash Pens? How long does it take uh, to hike? Let me just Mono see the Park Camp. from Mono to Indian Narrows and Pins. Yeah, that is well. Wow. Yeah, Dan, that is I, I, that's somewhat dependent. So that that area. Uh, so I showed a photo um, from a few years ago where from the Ray Fire. So actually, for about a year, you just it was like wide open. There really was no no trail much to speak of. You could sometimes see the faint uh, trail trail, but you just kind of hike. But now that um, that the chaparral is growing back and there has not been a trail project up there yet, Brian, if you're listening, as far as I know, um, it could be a little bit harder right, right now. Um, and so that section from Indian Canyon camp, which was one of my favorite uh, anywhere, two pins, that's the section that's off trail. You are in hiking in the river or in, in the creek the majority of the time. I mean, I would, I would give a half day, you know, five hours is what it usually takes me. And that's when I'm kind of booking. And um, I've also gone slower and done it in a, in, a, in a day. So there's so much to see. There's, there's pools big enough. You could have 50 people in them. There's one at least anyway. Uh, there are some really amazing spots and waterfalls. So that's a spot you want to take your, your time through. Awesome. Thank you. And one last question, Shad. Do you solo hike mostly or do you bring one or two friends or have a group? 
Yeah, that's a good question. So it's kind of funny. My spring break is kind of sacrosanct to me. And I usually do that solo. It's uh, it's the trip that I almost always do solo. Uh, I have done every spring break uh, trip solo for about 10 years in a row. Most of the other trips I do uh, with with people, um, the uh, B-man, Paul, Paul Cronshaw, I don't think he's in here, but he's one of my big hiking buddies. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Dad, awesome to have you with us. And last but not least, um, we've got Mr. Darren Brooks to present. Um, so Darren. Okay. I, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Hey, before you started, I just want to point out, um, you know, Brian had shown in his presentation that uh, there's some attention, some work that's going on up in slow counting, which is, the, you know, the premise of my, of my presentation here is a joke I always make with people just that how little attention slow county gets and how I kind of treat it like the, the poor stepchild, you know, everybody is it's so overlooked. And so I just want to say how glad I was to see all the different projects he's got going there. Awesome. All right. I'm going to share my screen and you are good to go, Darren. Yeah. Yeah. The poor middle child, you know, the Los Padres forest is stretches for hundreds of miles across all kinds of terrain from the Los, from San Rafael to the Cespi, the dramatic beauty of the Ventana wilderness. But tucked in between there, these show places is an unappreciated and ignored middle child of the Los Padres. And that's the tiny little wildernesses in the San Luis Obispo County. In comparison with the larger sections of Los Padres, the national forest of Slow County is way smaller. And like, while the San Rafael has over 6,000 foot peaks, the highest mountains in Slow County are like hills. I mean, I'll look at a map and you, you can see clearly why it's so easy to overlook the, the forests and the wilderness of this middle section of the Los Padres. While the attractions of the Los Padres in the north and the south are undeniable, there's still a lot to appreciate in the beautiful part of our forest that's in San Luis Obispo County. San Luis Obispo County, Los Padres is, however, is, is a patchwork of private property and national forests. It's got gates permanently and seasonally closed to access to the wilderness. And with all this private property, really the main hindrance to the ability to enjoy the Los Padres in Slow County is the difficulty in accessing the lands. And just a bit of uh, history, basically before there was a national forest in this region, there was a series of forest reserves created in around 1906. Ultimately, they were merged together in 1938 to become the Los Padres National Forest. And it was around that same time that Congress passed the Forest Homestead Act, 1906. It allowed people to lay claim to lands within the forest reserves. The act stated that any forest reserve lands that were valuable for agriculture could be occupied, quote, without injury to the forests, unquote. And claims were made on millions of acres of forest lands across the West. Within the forest, home centers, however, began to do damage to the environment. I mean, sheep herders would burn brush and torch forests to allow grass to grow for the next season. Overgrazing by cattle and uh, removal of trees led to soil erosion. Floods and fires threatened water supplies. Simultaneously, the boundaries of the forest, ranchers and farmers began erecting fences and putting up gates, closing off access to the forest and, to, and ultimately starving the homesteaders out. The groundwork was laid for our forest being private property and for the landowners being willing and able to block public access to it. This closure of, of public access is particularly evident in Slow County, where private property and cattle ranches have made access to the forest and particularly to our three little wildernesses up here, really difficult to say the least. The Machesna Wilderness has only two trail access points and private property and cattle ranches prevent access to American Canyon Trailhead for most of the year. I've heard that American Canyon is very beautiful, but apparently it's only accessible a few weeks a year during the height of summer. And because water sources are so limited in this area, it simply wouldn't be a time of year that a hiker would want to explore this, this wilderness. The other access is at Chester Springs Trailhead, which could not be more difficult to access. You, you have to drive all the way up and around through Pozo and then at the end of a long winding four wheel drive road, in the most remote reaches of the Los Padres, you find a lonely trailhead. The Garcia Wilderness has four trail access points, but again, the two northern trailheads are on private property and are inaccessible to the public. 
Meanwhile, the Caldwell Trout Creek Trailhead is off High Mountain Road, and that's a road that's closed every year, all of winter, nearly into summer sometimes. And we often wait a long time to ever get a chance to go out to that wilderness that way, and, and the gates never open. Um, Huasna Road out of Arroyo Grande is the only regular access to a huge stretch of the Los Padres. It's open all year. It's a narrow corridor through 14 miles of private property that ultimately ends at a gate just a few miles short of the wilderness. Anybody who wants to go to the Garcia Wilderness really has to work to get there. Since the 1960s, the lands between Huasna Township and the forest have been owned by the Meser Land and Development Company out of Long Beach. It's a multi-billion dollar cattle ranching company. And they've tried successfully and repeatedly to take access away from the, uh, to us from the forest. I can remember back in the early 1990s, uh, I would drive out Huasna Road to camp out at Agua Escondido Campground or at Stony Creek Campground. Um, around 1995, However, that, that they put up more gates and now both these campgrounds, as you see in that sign there, that both these campgrounds are permanently closed. And they were awesome campgrounds. What's left of it there on the right. Ultimately though, one of the main reasons that any of this really matters to me is, is the Condor Trail because it's a trail that we would all love to see made. It climbs the backbone of the Los Padres, staying out of towns and off roads to take hikers from the Sespe to the Ventana Wilderness. But where it really, a big area where that's a big problem is in this middle section of the Los Padres in San Luis Obispo County. You have all this private property and you have cattle ranches, gates, fences cutting it off. If the Condor Trail was to really follow the existing trails through this area, you would ultimately end up having to trespass on private property. Not that we would ever actually ever do that ourselves. Efforts have been made in, in recent years to try to bypass these private lands and to keep the trail exclusively within the national forest. But in truth, it's probably not going to be possible in quite a few places. The terrain is simply too rugged and the cost too prohibitive to create a trail that would skirt these private lands. The difficulty is trying to build a trail on the side of mountains to drop hundreds of feet down into a deep ravine just to climb back up the other side of a deep ravine in order to avoid a road that is happens to be on private property. On the right, you see a perfect example where in the Garcia wilderness in the southwestern corner, if you're coming from Caldwell Mesa, you have to cross into private property where Sto lower Stony Creek is and then return back into the wilderness again. And the problem is that's all on private property. At the north end of the county, the, the Condor Trail reaches Highway 41 and for all intents and purposes, completely ends. I mean, anyone wanting to continue on, and I'm sure Mike Mackey can say this, you have to continue walking on a busy highway to, to uh, end up getting over to the coast. In the end, everyone wants to see a condor trail. I just don't know sometimes how that's gonna be possible. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Jaren. Super informative. Uh, one question that we had from Michelle Gillian, are there trails across the Moros? No, I don't think so. I, I'm not, if, is she talking about the Seven Sisters? Is that what we're talking about? It, it, I think so, if she's talking about that, I, I, not that I'm aware of. Yes. That's yeah, right. yeah, yeah. No, that, as far as I know, there's not. I mean, with, once in a while you could hike, uh, hike up one at one or two of them, but most of those are on, <laughs> imagine this, they're on private property and they won't let you, they won't let you climb it. I remember climbing Hollister Peak years ago and now you can't climb that one either. So I don't know. Any other questions for Darren? Oh, it looks like somebody actually been to Agua Escondido, it says. Such a great camp, I know. Uh, so Lori wondered, I pay for Gaia GPS and All Trails Pro. Is there a free GPS map source that others use? That's a question for somebody else. Anybody else with an answer want to chime in? 
Okay. Uh, Steve, Steven says, SAR topo is good on the computer. Okay, awesome. One more question for you, Darren. Uh, what is a good first time backpacking destination in Slow County? Um, well, I, it sounded like Brian was talking about them clearing Upper Lopez. And if that was the case, there's some great, there's two camps that are up Upper Lopez that that are, if the trail was, was kept up, it would be great to maybe uh, park at Big Falls and hike up to uh, Sulphur Pots or up to Upper Lopez on your way up to the Quest of Grade. That's a beautiful area up there and could be a neat overnight camp trip. Yeah, Poison Oak is terrible up there, absolutely terrible. You just pretend that you don't feel it. All right. Well, I think um, we don't have any more questions. That wraps us up for the evening. So I just want to say thank you so much to all of our. Oh wait, we've we've got uh, one more question. So, um, we did have a question about um, the restrictions. Um, under COVID for LPFA trail work and uh, under what conditions those restrictions would be lifted. I'm gonna let Brian answer that one. No hablo inglés. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's, a tough, that's a tough question for this, this point of the evening. I think whoever asked that question, why don't they uh, uh, contact me tomorrow and uh, we, we can we can talk about it and at, at that point in time. Sounds sounds good. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us again. Um, like many folks mentioned in their presentations, if you're interested about any of these spots or heard about a place that sounds exciting to you, please go check it out on hikelospadres.com. It's a wonderful resource uh, for backpacking, hiking, finding camps, getting inspired. Um, and if you do go out and hike a trail, fill out a trail survey on hikelosepadres.com. We love to see it. And it really helps us to know what's going on around the forest. Where do we need to put our resources next? Um, and if you put photos on, it's great for the next person who comes along to, to see what's happening at the different spots um, along the forest. So uh, thank you so much for being here tonight. And um, you'll probably be hearing from me in an email um, to hear about how this experience was for you. We're hoping if, um, if we get enough uh, enthusiasm that this could become a recurring event. So if you were inspired by this um, tonight and you'd like to present next time, um, you can shoot me an email. My email is uh, Kendra at LPForest dot org and um, I hope to connect with you more in the future thank you so much everybody we're going to be signing off now but um, thank you for all our presenters and thank you for joining us have a good night everybody see you next time <laughs>